Welcome one and all, it's that special time of the week again, that's right, it's time for another all-star installment of Cape TV. As always, I'm your host, Cape Joel, and joining me all the way from the Fortress of Solitude, it is... Matt. We're recording this show on Sunday night, which is unheard of. We usually do this one Saturday, because that way we can catch up on all the shows from the week that was, and also we can catch up on the Saturday morning cartoons and stuff like Justice League Action, and even Rebels usually airs on Saturday, doesn't it, Matt? It does, but it's now on hiatus, I think. It's on hiatus, but you know what? This was a pretty good time because the same week that Rebels went on hiatus, Flash and all the other big CW shows return. Now, I mentioned that we're recording this Sunday. Usually we record the Comic Multiverse, the show we do over on the Cape Joel channel. So, you know, <laughs> Matt and I, we're in the middle of something of a podcast dash right now tonight. <laughs> Because he was doing stuff yesterday, and I couldn't get a fill-in host because it felt like everyone and their mother was at PAX. So if you're hearing this one late, or if you're hearing this one for the first time on time over on the Weekly Pull channel or over on the Cape Joel channel, you'll know why. I just thought I should get that out of the way and let everyone know the nuts and bolts of the behind the scenes. Yeah, it was a pretty hectic day yesterday for, I think, both of us. <laughs> mm, oh, God, yeah. yeah. It never stops when you're an internet podcast personality, I tell you. Not that I'm complaining or anything, I have the best job in the world. Because we get to talk about stuff like Supergirl Season 2, Episode 9, Supergirl Lives. Now, people might not know this about my podcast associate, Matt, here, but he is probably one of the biggest Superman fans you will ever be likely to meet. In fact, his Skype avatar right now is him wearing a Superman shirt, so that should let you know. So, take this one away. Hey, Matt, I'm going to let you take point on this one. Yeah, so this episode, uh, it saw Kevin Smith directing mm -hmm. uh, his first episode for Supergirl. and Thus the name, was a kind of, reference to his Superman Lives movie that never got made. It was. The, there were a couple of references in the episode to that as well. <laughs> was there a um, giant but, spider? Did she fight a giant spider at the end? No, but Monel mentions a Thanagarian snare beast. <laughs> okay. See, I don't typically watch Supergirl unless it's related to a crossover or something. Not that I don't like it, I just don't have the time for another show. But man, that kind of makes me want to watch it now. But, or don't watch this episode because it was a pretty bad episode. Oh, was it? That's depressing. How come? Yeah. Um, well, this episode saw Supergirl and Monel go after a bunch of slavers who are taking people from planet Earth thanks to Roulette. Uh, um, do you know who Roulette is? Yeah, yeah, Roulette. Minor villainess. She was in Justice League a little bit there. She's got like a gambling yeah. theme, thus the name Roulette. Yeah, yeah, she's like a, an Asian woman dressed in like a red dress with like a tattoo of a dragon or something. Okay, so, really she's, she, so she's pretty close to the comic, actually, is how you're making it sound. Well, you know, it's like the easiest co costume to ever have. It is. It's like China white. What do you need? Ah, just a white suit. Yeah, um, and yeah, she's t d dealing with these slavers and they take people. And one of the characters they take is uh, Kevin Smith's daughter. Oh, and uh, Harley Quinn Smith. She, yeah, she's a big part of the plot because her mother comes to Kara looking for help from Supergirl because they know Supergirl and Kara talk. They don't know. Same, same thing with like Clark, how Clark knows Superman, that sort of thing. Right, right. Um, and then, yeah, she goes and looks for him, and they wind up on this, this other planet that has a red sun. Oh. So, but and what really uh, kind of angered me, and, and it actually angered the, the Justice League action writers, because they did an episode recently with Superman on a red sun planet. An excellent um, episode. But uh, in this, their powers just go away straight away oh, as soon go. as they see red sun. It's n not like, uh, you know, over time like it should be. In fact, they did a yeah, story yeah. just recently in the comics where Superman and yeah. Lex got sent to a red sun planet and his powers didn't disappear all at once and he got to prove that he was good even without his powers. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, and and it happened with Monel as well, which doesn't kind of make any sense, but um Yeah, cuz his powers work differently, right? Cuz he's a he's a dad. Yeah, a little differently. Yeah, a little differently. But um yeah, and then it, it's just really Supergirl being Supergirl without her powers for the rest of the episode. Right, it's one of those. Now, you were telling me you weren't a fan of mon -El's costume. I haven't seen what it looks like in the Supergirl show yet. Oh, well, he hasn't got a costume yet. He's just wearing, like, the oh, usual okay. person thing. But um, he gets one, I think, either next episode or the next episode after that. <laughs> and um, it's just a D.E.O. Suit like a um a tactical suit like they wear in Shield or something. Oh, what was but with, what was wrong with the red onesie and the blue cape? 
That, that, well, that's the thing. Like, I don't know why they can't do that if they can do stuff like Supergirl's costume, Superman's costume, Martian, Martian Man. Manhunter's. Yeah, why can't they just give him like like some ceremonial Daxamite robes or something? It, it, it seems to me, Supergirl, and this is like someone from the outside looking in, they are very hit or miss with their costume. Either they get it great, like Supergirl, Superman, Martian Manhunter, even freaking Banshee looked amazing in the yeah, show. Yeah. Or they totally flub it like Red Tornado. Yeah, it, it's so weird how they do it. I don't know whether it's because of budget or something, mm. but, but then again with like mon costume, it's basically Superman's costume, but with no S. Yeah. And it, and then eventually he gets, like, a little S, like, badge on the side of his, his costume. But, like, they could just reuse the costume. Now, let me ask you this, because, again, I don't watch Supergirl regularly, and you're, of course, an expert on all things Superman, so I defer to you on this one. Have they dropped any references about the future and Legion of Superheroes and that sort of thing yet? Well, I'll get to that when I talk about Flash, because there's something that happens at the end of this episode that I think relates to Flash. Ooh, and we know these two shows are going to be having a crossover very soon. Yes. So, so parting thoughts on Supergirl Lives? You didn't sound like you were much of a fan? Not this episode. It, it, it definitely seemed like a back-to-basics when they were on, what were the NBC or something, mm-hmm. when they deal with more of, like, the the teen drama sort of thing. Cause they also had like a, a big subplot with Kara's sister and Maggie Sawyer. Cause they're a thing. Oh, are this. they really on the show? Oh really? They brought Maggie Sawyer into the show. Holy shit. Yeah. 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 She's been around since the first episode of season two. Um, do, 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 do they yeah, have they're... her partner Turpin yet or have they not brought in Turpin? I think they referenced him in the first episode. Oh, that's pretty good though. Tur- yeah. Turpin, who is of course a reference to Jack Kirby. So if they ever, if we ever see him, they'll need to find an actor who looks like Jack Kirby, <laughs> which is difficult because not everyone looks like Jack Kirby. So yeah, that was Supergirl. Not a big or not as big a fan as you have been of past episodes. Not a n- not a great return, no. but there's places for it to go by what you're making it sound. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Okay, now at this point in the show, we would talk about Arrow. Except for the big problem that I don't watch Arrow. I've tried to suffer through season one, but couldn't do it because Green Arrow is my favorite hero. And it's hard for me to see anything short of what that show does as sacrilege every week. I know plenty of people like it, and that's fine. I know many people have told me, you know, oh, you got to hop back into it. You got to give it a chance. And I've heard other people who used to like the show tell me, nah, it's been going downhill since season four. Matt used to watch it. And the way we used to do on the show is, you know, he would tell me about it and we'd kind of riff and whatever. But now you've quit too, Matt. What was the final nail in the coffin for you for quitting Arrow? Well, I I just kind of forgot about it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, it's funny. It was the show that kicked off this whole CW superhero show renaissance. And yet, despite that, they give you less and less reason to come back to it by the sounds of it. Yeah, I just, like, the last couple of episodes I watched were the ones just before the big, um crossover they had and it just wasn't interesting me because that he's now got like the the arrow team which is mad dog mm. um ragman who, yeah ragman and mr terrific and that i don't find him interesting especially mad dog who actually actively kills people and oliver's like okay with it even though like a big thing now is like i don't kill anymore i'm not gonna kill anyone anymore yeah the, the morality of arrow was all over the place and that was another thing that bugged me about season one but you know what we've beaten that dead horse plenty let's just move on from there we just wanted to acknowledge arrow so people who were a fan you know weren't uh, weren't asking hey where's arrow and that's not to say we'll never talk about it in the future i always wanted to design cape tv as a show where we could bring in guests who watch shows we don't so they could talk about them and in fact if everyone i knew wasn't away at pax i might have gotten someone in to talk about riverdale did you see that riverdale the new archie show <laughs> No, I'm not really too interested in it. Neither am I. I've never been an Archie person. In fact, the only Archie people I know are, like, my grandpa and stuff. I know the comics have gotten, like, really interesting again because they've gotten great writers like Mark Wade and stuff to write, you know, new, interesting, modern stuff. But even still, like, when I saw the trailer for Riverdale, I, I kind of laughed uproariously because I'm like, oh, they're doing a dark, edgy teen take on Archie? Really? We- we've come to this point now, huh? And uh, it's yeah, funny. I had a chance to watch it because apparently it goes right from airing to being right on Netflix. So like the first episode was there. 
Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I saw like a trailer for it because I was I was mildly interested to see how they would do like Archie, especially nowadays. And they've they've really like I guess CW fired it. Mm. I think we can safely say not for us, but I don't doubt it will find an audience out there. Oh, most definitely. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll find an audience. I hope people who like Archie enjoy it. Uh, now, next up, a show that I know Matt and I both watched this week. That is The Flash Season 3, Episode 10, Borrowing Problems from the Future. Yeah, this is uh, the return of Flash uh, for the second part of Season 3, and mm. it was a pretty cool episode. It was a cool episode. You know what? It's funny. It's one of these things where we had a villain of the week in Plunder, who uh, lo- looks a lot like his comic counterpart, only, you know, minus the white suit and all the other stuff. But this is definitely one of those episodes where the villain was so secondary to all the personal stuff that was going on. We get to see Wally finally kind of come into his own as Kid Flash now. He's finally allowed to go out on missions with Barry. Mm-hmm, yep. And I was worried for a second that they'd be backtracking again, because, of course, Barry is worrying about this horrible vision he had in the future of Iris getting killed by Savitar. And because of it, he kind of treats Wally shitty on their first mission. And Wally's like, did I do bad, coach? And I'm like, no, no, Wally, don't don't backtrack. You're doing good. Don't don't be that guy again. (laughs) And in a nice reversal of fortunes, now his dad, Joe, is like, no, son, you did good. You know, for once, he's actually supporting his superhero. And I thought that was nice. Yeah, they definitely actually put some character development into them. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, like, as you said, yeah, Plunder was definitely, like, one of those minor villains that is only there just because he's in the comics and he's kind of a Flash villain and stuff another, like that. Another Jeff Johns creation. It's funny, he was actually kind of a force to be reckoned with in the comics. He wasn't from the future, although I don't think they imply he's from the future in this. I think they imply his weapon is from the future, but he's not, they don't give him very much backstory. I know in the comics he was, like, from a mirror keystone city, and he, like, tried to take over the rogues for a minute. Right. Yeah, he, uh, not much to write home about. Again, basically he exists because he's got a cool gun with tracer bullets, because how do you fight speedsters with tracer bullets, of course? Yeah, but that's the one thing that, like, I, or oh, two things in this episode. One, they, that a speedster has trouble keeping up with just like a normal dirt bike yeah i saw that scene and thought the same thing but you know it's a souped up future bike maybe and his bullets keep firing (laughs) stuff maybe it was a cool scene though as ridiculous as it was considering how fast they've been shown to be in other episodes yeah and like the bullets what i don't get they're, they're like super futuristic bullets so you think they they can like go through anything and whatnot so like why doesn't Barry just, like, go invisible and face? He eventually does that, but they get stopped by, like, concrete. I was thinking, like, these bullets are, like, top-of-the-line future <laughs> tech, like, and they're stopped by something that's been around for thousands of years. Like, Come doesn't on. make much sense. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that, that's a problem with the Flash sometimes. He forgets he has near-godlike powers every so often. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, he forgets he can throw energy and go invisible and do all sorts of stuff. (laughs) Oh, come on, man. If we had superpowers, I'm sure we'd forget we had them, wink. (laughs) (laughs) Nah, man, if I could throw energy, I'd be throwing it all all the goddamn time. If I could walk through walls, I'd be doing it all the goddamn time. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I mean, there's that. Uh, Wally, or not Wally, uh, Barry finally comes clean to Iris about what he saw. You know, I see, I see your death. And she gets all freaked out, and they come clean to the team and everything. They don't come clean to Joe, though. You notice that? Yeah, I I can imagine why. (laughs) Man, you know, you think Barry would learn now, where it's like, no, 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 no. You can't tell some people the truth and keep the truth from other people. You gotta either tell the truth all the time or none of the time. (laughs) He's very, he's, he's very, you know, uneven when it comes to that, isn't he? And it's bitten him in the ass how many times? Yeah, yeah, a lot. (laughs) A lot, a lot of times. Uh, We go back to the paper, uh, the one that used to be held by the evil reverse Flash with the byline uh, written by Iris about the Flash disappearing in a crisis. That's changed now, which means the future has changed. And it's funny, Matt, that date that they give, I think it's like May, was like May 17th, 2017 or something? Yeah, something like that. Something like that. That's, That's the date for the season finale of this season. Oh, there you go. That's a nice touch. I was a fan of that. I'm like, oh, look at you being all clever and having the big important date be the season finale <laughs> of this season. Uh, 
what else was going this oh uh julian malfoy that's what i call him julian malfoy <laughs> joins team flash officially now and honestly i'm really excited about it i think ever since the original harrison wells left that team kind of needed the dick to outweigh everybody else yeah yeah especially with this new like hipster mm. harrison wells who, who's kind of hit and miss he is a lot of the he? time he really yeah. is. You know, he won me over near the end of last season. He was annoying me a little in this episode. Then he won me back again. I mean, you got to give it to that actor, though. Tom Tom Cavanaugh, right? That's his name? Yeah, yeah. He's a great actor. He's amazing. And he really is the glue that kind of holds this show together. I think he's the secret weapon. No wonder they keep bringing him back in different roles. Yeah, yeah, totally. The, uh, the other big thing about this is that the heroes eventually realize uh, if they can stop certain events in history from happening, then maybe they can save Iris from her death at the hands of Savitar. And it's cool because they totally end up, you know, like lampposting events that will happen in the future. They talk about Barry's fight with the Music Meister, which will be coming up in the Supergirl crossover. They talk about Gorilla Grodd, which is going to be a huge two-parter. Yep, yeah, they're, they're going to go visit uh, Gorilla City as well. Oh, that's going to be so cool. It is. Can, can you believe, Matt, on television, we already have sidekicks and we're going to be getting Gorilla City, where in the movies they're just getting all this started now. Yeah, it, it's pretty crazy. The amount of stuff you can do on television is just insane in this day and age. And the other big thing is they talk about Killer Frost being at large. So at the end of this, uh, Caitlin will eventually probably take up the mantle as killer frost we just don't know if she's going to do it as a hero or as a villain yet she'll do it as a hero because that's what's happening in the comics at the moment yeah of course she's getting a massive push in the comics right now off the back of justice league uh, versus suicide squad so it only makes sense that she's going to eventually become a hero which man they, they forget you know the cw invasion team or whatever flash has the makings of his own super team on his show right now oh yeah totally definitely it's crazy the way they're doing yeah, that. Yeah, but but um, just before we finish it, I'll just talk about that uh, thing I was going to talk about in Supergirl. But um, at yes, the end of Supergirl, um, when oh yeah, another thing I forgot to mention in the Supergirl episode because it's just so forgettable. Apparently, the Dominators are in there. Oh, still. Yeah, they're uh, the Dominators of Supergirl's universe, and they're um, they they know who Monel is for some reason. Interesting. Huh. Um, but a bunch. of of these people that we've seen i think we saw them in the first episode or one of the first episodes or at the end of season two uh end of season one um these people are looking for mon we don't know who they are but they're like these hooded people that came from space mm. and they have like a holographic projection of mon we don't know who they are um but they show up again looking for mon but i think this maybe relates to what happened at the end of flash this week which is another hooded person with a holographic prediction yes. of Harrison Wells shows up. Yes, she sure does. Did you love that that scene was totally Terminator, right down to the stuff blowing in the wind, her coming through the portal and landing like the Terminator? Yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that, and I think they're related to the Legion of Superheroes. Mm, wouldn't that be something? Again, because these shows are going to be crossing over soon, wouldn't it be something... To be like, that's that's like the B-plot of the Music Meister thing. Like, oh, hey, you get this fun musical episode, but also you get them kind of talking about and maybe launching Legion of Superheroes. That'd be pretty cool, because we know the Legion ring exists in Supergirl's world. We do. Furthermore, you know, talking about stuff that's happening in the comics, the Legion yeah. is getting a gigantic push right now. Again, Justice League Suicide Squad, they had Emerald Empress, who is a villain in the Legion Pantheon, and she's apparently going to be having a big crossover in the Superman and Supergirl books. So, hey, there you yep. go. Yeah, I could definitely see it happening. And if you've read the Supergirl book, and I know Matt has, it's basically just the Supergirl TV show now. It really is. It really is. So, you know, hey, it might happen. In fact, I have it on some good authority that that's exactly what they're going to be doing, but you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> so that's that's the way the winds are blowing with that one but yeah flash uh borrowing problems from the future i liked it i thought it was a fun first episode back i know sometimes and again we saw it with supergirl the first episode back's a little bit shaky yeah yeah definitely i thought this one had a good beginning middle and end and i like that it gives us stuff to look forward to to be like hey these are the big events coming down the pipeline get ready for those 
yeah, it hints at some awesome stuff to happen. Definitely. Now, after that, we had the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 4, Episode 11, Wake Up. Yeah, this was a Melinda May-centric episode. Which are always some of my favorites. Basically, May is trapped in the Matrix. Basically, yeah. It, well, not that. Trapped in a Matrix in a Matrix. Yeah, oh god, it's, it's Inception. There's layers of Matrix in here. Yeah, and she has to try to escape, which uh, leads to some really cool fight scenes with oh, her and God. Ada and a bunch of other people as well. When she's fighting Ada in, like, the empty apart room thing, I'm like, push her out the window, push her out the window. Yeah, she pushed her out the <laughs> No, kick her off the thing. Kick her Ah, oh, she kicked her off the thing. <laughs> God damn, the May fights are the best fights in this show, isn't it? Like, I think it's hard for them to top her fights. There was the one where she fought, like, the May impersonator, and now this one yeah. with the android. And they do that great bit, too, where she's, like, hit Ada really hard, but because she's an LMD, she doesn't feel it. She just keeps walking. Yeah, yeah, the the whole Terminator thing. Yeah, wow, it's a really Terminator heavy week, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, we had that story going on, and then we had the actual Maybot, the Mayborg, who after the previous issue is or issue issue. I like I call them issues, not episodes. You can tell what my day job <laughs> is. After the previous episode, she's starting to question her own robo-humanity now and what's up, and because of it, she sort of turns on Radcliffe after a fashion. Yeah, she starts, she starts to become a little bit, I guess, self-aware and, and mm -hmm. aware that she is a robot and she's not, I guess, real, but she, she thinks she's real because she has literally a copy of May's mind in mm -hmm. her head. This is all reasons why AI is a freaking crapshoot and why you shouldn't play God with <laughs> robots. No, no, you shouldn't. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff going there. I like that, that the Maybot isn't so subservient to Radcliffe, and now she's kind of got her own side story going on now, this Pinocchio, am I a real boy thing. Yeah, it's definitely, it's really cool. I did not expect them to go that way with it, and... And just to make it even crazier, Radcliffe drops the bomb. Oh yeah, she's not the only LMD. I snuck another one in there you don't know about. Yeah, that that's gonna be pretty cool. And we I guess it was kind of him, maybe? Possibly. Because I know because at the end of this episode, Fitz shoots him and we find out that Radcliffe himself also has an LMD. Yeah, I mean, it, or is that a red herring? Is that the thing? Are they yeah. trying to fake us out on it? I, uh, yeah. My mind, or my theory, was always on Fitz himself, because Fitz has been alone with Radcliffe so much, he could easily have swapped him out at any point, and we wouldn't have known. Yeah, totally. I, I think it could definitely be that. Or, or they could flip it again, and it could be Simmons. Oh, yeah, yeah, because you're, you're spending so much time concentrating on Fitz, it might be. Yeah, yeah, that's true. This is this is just a good old fashioned robot who done it. I'm sure a lot of people out there who remember Battlestar, it's kinda of like, oh, who's the Cylon? Yeah, and uh, along with that we also got the story with the government and everything mm. and um because after last week's episode where we found out that Mace isn't an inhuman or isn't even a super soldier. No, he's um, faking it. He's a big faker. Yeah, he's a big phony. Colson's trying to trying to get that power from him mm. and uh Talbot and it doesn't end very well. No, it's a real uphill battle. They basically end up getting called into the principal's office and get yelled at. And, <laughs> and the reason they end up having to deal with the government is because uh, Senator Nadir, the evil senator who's back in the Watchdogs, wants Daisy to sign the Sokovia Accords, which is a wonderful piece of continuity. Yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's really great. It's, they've already had um, uh, Yo-Yo sign it, so now they want some more Inhumans to sign it. And it's even better is that Nadine is like knows everything that's going on inside Shield because she's connected to May as well because she can see through May's eyes. Yeah, yeah, she she's got a rat or a mole or however you want to put it. Yeah, that uh so great. Yeah, I mean there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on this season. There's a lot of layers. Uh hey, wouldn't it be funny if Talbot ended up being the other LMD? That'd be insane. Cuz he just Ta kind of Talbot or, or Nadine. Yeah, cuz they just kind of show up out of nowhere. And, like, again, they could easily have been replaced at any time and you would have no idea they were acting strangely. But, yeah, I mean, that was all really cool. Uh, we get a little bit more of the Mac Yo-Yo romance this episode. I would have to say they're definitely one of my favorite couples in the show. And they're definitely one of the ones most fraught with perils because it's like, come on, get together, just get together, you two. Why is it so hard? Yeah, it's kind of like a, um, 
like a copy of uh, Fitz and Simmons' relationship as yeah. well, how they started out as sort of workmates and then yeah. slowly blossom into what they have now. And it's they're kind of doing that with Mac and Yo-Yo, and I, I really like it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, hey, it's, it's always good to have a little bit of romance in a, in your super action spy show. And we learn a little bit more about Mac this episode, too, that he was married once before and he has a dead kid. And that's why he's, you know, being so hard and so difficult to get into a relationship with. And I'm like, all right, all right, I, I buy that. That's cool. I understand that. Yeah, and it's it's great. It's kind of like a flip because usually in stuff like that, it's usually the woman who has that kind of background. Yeah, yeah. So now, now they've given it to Mac. It's a very, it's a very weedin' ass twist to do. And also, maybe he actually has a daughter who's dead and a wife, or maybe he's the LMD too. Again, they leave it with a big red <laughs> herring, so you don't know. That was kind of the thing. It's like m- much like back in season one when you didn't know who the Hydra uh, traitor was. They're doing it here again, where they give you just enough evidence to suspect everybody. Yeah, yeah, totally. If they can pull something off like that, what they did with the Hydra agent thing with Ward, mm-hmm. and, oh, it'd be amazing. Which, it's funny, I uh, I actually truly do believe this was my conspiracy theory when that happened, is they didn't actually know who the rat was, they waited to see who's people who people's least favorite character was, and then they made that person <laughs> the rat. <laughs> well, they do like what they do in, like, movies like that, how they film everyone as the, as the Hydra agent, and then choose one. Yeah, just to throw people off. They do the Clue thing where it's like, oh, well, there's multiple different endings to Clue depending on what theater you saw it in. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Wake Up, fun episode. Matt and I are digging this episode. We know a lo- in a lot of places we're kind of the lone voices on this one. I think some people find the robot plot to be boring or at least derivative of other similar robot plot lines. But hey, we've been asking for LMGs this whole time, so hey, we're, we're having fun. Yeah, and I think people also feel maybe a little bit spoiled after the Ghost Rider arc it's true, as well. It's true. We mentioned this last week, and it bears repeating. It's going to be hard to top Ghost Rider for a bit. Like, that was so... To, to pardon the term, that was hot fire is what that was. <laughs> this is this is cold steel, but cold steel is also fine. So, uh, from the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to the Legends of Tomorrow, we had Season 2, Episode 9, Raiders of the Lost Art. And again, for people... Ooh, this is their first time listening to Kate TV or first time listening to Matt and myself. Oh boy, do we have a love-hate relationship with Legends <laughs> of Tomorrow. Because like, even if you like the show, you got to admit, this show is fucking dumb a lot of the time. They do such stupid things, but every so often, they'll do some cool shit. And you'll be like, okay, I'm having fun again. But uh, yeah, I mean, where, where do we even start with this episode? I guess... To refresh you from the previous season, the team is looking for the Spear of Destiny, which is the MacGuffin that all the bad guys are after. And to get it, they need to find Rip Hunter, but Rip Hunter isn't himself. He's uh, acting like a 60s movie director now. Yeah, and a 60s movie director who goes to school with George Lucas. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, George Lucas is a huge plot point of this episode. In fact, he becomes one of those time aberrations that they keep wanting to cure. And the deal is because the Legends, once again, screwed up history by interacting with it. Again, the Legends are bulls in a china shop. They spend half their time fixing their own problems, so much to the point I didn't even think about that until you mentioned it, Matt. I'm like, oh yeah, wait, this was their fault too. Yeah. <laughs> the, the fact that George Lucas might not make movies means that he never made Star Wars and never made Indiana Jones, which means Citizen Steel and uh, Roy Palmer, the Atom, never become geniuses and never follow in their particular field, be it as an inventor or be it as a historian. But it's not enough that they just don't become who they're going to be and, you know, hence don't get access to their powers. They become, like, dumb. They become, like, dumb yeah. heads. Even though, like, uh, Palmer says, oh, I'm just a heart surgeon now, and I'm just a yoga instructor. I'm like, that doesn't mean you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, like, he's a fucking heart surgeon. You don't just become one. You don't just answer an <laughs> ad in the back back of a paper. Oh, I'll become a heart surgeon. <laughs> Like, again, this is the show here where it's like, we really need to show they're dumb, though, that they're not the smart guys they used to be. How do we do that? Duh, I don't know. I well, never I never saw the Star Wars, so now I'm dumb. The, the problem with that is is that they've both been absolutely idiots the whole time they've been on this team. <laughs> it's true. Like, they've been absolutely... Like, uh, like, Ray Palmer, he's the biggest idiot ever. He forgot he could rebuild his suit. He forgets to use his suit most of the time. 
Yeah, it, it's just, oh my god. Which, which let's face it, the, the reason a lot of these characters are dumb is tied to budgetary constraints. That's why they keep breaking up Stein and Jax, even though they're yep. only good together when they form Firestorm. Yeah, and, and you know, they're on every poster and everything for this show, except they're hardly in it. It's true. This was another episode, because the B-plot, which as far as I'm concerned was the good plot, was Heat Wave coming clean to Dr. Stein that he's been seeing visions of Captain Cold all over the place, and he fears he's going crazy, and the Doctor kind of helps And That was the good part of this episode, and it involved no punching. It was a very quiet, downbeat story. It was, but it also begs the question, like, so... So that like, Ray's now like an idiot or more of an idiot than he usually is. So like, why don't they just replace him with Stein, who had no effect, who, uh, who's never saw Star Wars or anything, didn't ha- wasn't affected by it. So he's still smart. So yeah. why didn't they just replace him? Yeah, yeah. Stein's a Trekkie. Uh, he was he was inspired by Flash Gordon because he's older. He's like Star Wars. I watched the <laughs> I watched the serials that was based on. Young man. <laughs> <laughs> that's what made me a big nerd i love too is that they have this like life or death fight they're going on with uh with these evil villains and meanwhile no that's no, fine stein uh stein and heatwave they can just hang out on the ship and we won't say anything yeah, did we even see Jax this episode yeah he was there well well, well here's the thing <laughs> when they needed to get uh rip out of jail they send stein who has no powers they send uh sarah who you know is a good fighter but ultimately has no powers uh, Jackson. Oh no, wait. Heat Wave was there too. So they send basically everyone who has no powers to go in and fight the Legion of Doom. And oh my God, we need to talk about this, Matt. Oh my God. <laughs> so riddle me this and wrap your minds around this, if you dare. The Legion of Doom in the Legends universe is only called the Legion of Doom because Citizen Steel watched Super Friends growing up. <laughs> Why is my nose bleeding? So you mean to tell me in this universe, these guys are aware of superheroes like Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. Although, although I will give this to the show's credit, Super Friends actually didn't have Green Arrow or Flash, in which are the two heroes that they're aware of. But even still, ow, they met Supergirl. <laughs> And we know Superman exists in that <laughs> universe. And, like, they tried to be cute with it. They tried to be cute. And he's like, oh, well, you know, that reminds me of the old Hanna-Barbera cartoon. And I actually got into a fight with someone on Twitter who said, oh, well, they were being really vague with it. They said Hanna-Barbera cartoon. No, no, that's not vague at all. That's well, like, very Well, direct. what other cartoon? It's not Scooby fucking do. Yeah, the Legion <laughs> of Doom never showed up there. Well, actually, a couple of villains showed up there, but so did Batman and Superman. So the point is moot all the same. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't write a reason for why they're called the Legion of Doom. <laughs> they just watched the cartoon. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of the bit if you ever watched the Josie and the Pussycats movie and they wondered why the other girl came along on the trip and they're like, hey, why are you here? And her answer is, oh, I was in the cartoon. And I'm like, fourth wall destroyed. <laughs> just destroyed. Also, here's another thing that got me this episode. So... Our villains du jour are Damien Dark and Merlin, who Mm -hmm. don't have superpowers but are pretty good at stuff, who are just normal dudes. They take not one but two shots from the Wave Rider, and they don't die. Well, is Damien Dark... uh, He's not immortal, is he? He's got powers. I don't know. Arrow really messed a lot of stuff up by saying, oh, well, they all have access to the Lazarus pit and I don't freaking know I mean I know he's been alive for a really long time Damien Dark but I assume that was just because he was kept taking dips in the bath yeah yes like yeah shouldn't they be like blown up or something you would think apparently it's nice to know that the bullets on the the, you know that the blasters on the wave rider are real shit it's nice to know that (laughs) That, that, that they can't do anything against these two guys who are mostly human. And again, I know they're really good at what they do and everything, but come on, there's like six legends and two of them. Yeah, and and half the legends actually have powers. Yeah, you mean you can't take these guys? It would be one thing if Reverse Flash was on their side, and indeed by the end of the episode he actually is, with a really corny excuse of, hey, what were you doing, something else? Yeah, yeah, I was just... Doing something. You know what he was doing? He was kicking Barry's dad in the balls over and over again, because that's something Reverse Flash would do. 
<laughs> I hate you, Barry. I hate you. I hate you so much. But yeah, th- that was some of the weak sauce stuff of the episode. I mean, I guess I guess we'll talk about what's good about it. I I like movie director Rip way more than I liked other Rip. Oh, he's much more interesting. Much more interesting, much more compelling. He does a good American accent too, doesn't he? He does, yeah. He does a really good American accent, and e- even the reason that he did it is very like, uh, very like Men in Black too, where he's like, "Oh well, I knew where the Spear of Destiny was, but I couldn't even trust myself with the information, so I like wiped my own mind to make sure it would stay safe." Yeah, and and it's just hidden under the floorboards. Yeah, of very the Wave Rider. <laughs> yeah, just very close. It was just there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, will also say the actor they got to be young George Lucas looked a lot like a young George Lucas. It looked a lot like him but didn't sound like him. No, 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 they like they couldn't get the voice just right, could they? The no. Gungan, you see in the Gungan, see he's just going to pull out that little lightsaber and he's uh, he's just going to go to town is what he's going to do. <laughs> That's another thing, too. Like, again, I admit, Star Wars, the first one, an amazing work of art and film work driven by one guy's dream. Same with Raiders and everything. But it's funny, now we know in geek culture that maybe we've always given George Lucas a little too much credit. Yeah, well, like, it's weird. Like, I understand, like, why they they did, like, the whole Indiana Jones stuff. But, like, shouldn't shouldn't... Steven Spielberg gets some credit as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was also kind of involved in that. And furthermore, should not the lady who edited the original Star Wars, who, who, who was Lucas's wife, right? She was the one who uh, yeah. edited. Shouldn't she yeah. get more credit for saving what we all know now is actually a really terrible movie in, uh, what is it, in, in like when they first shot it, like she saved that in editing. Should she not get yeah. some credit? Yeah, yeah, and all all the like the producers and stuff that mm-hmm. that told Lucas like what was a bad idea and what wasn't. No, you can't have a giant green rabbit in here. No, you can't have any of these other things. <laughs> l- l- like here's the thing. Like yes, I I'm glad you know we give credit to George Lucas for being the font from all of this springs from. But we know now with hindsight being 2020 and also just a good rule of thumb, movies arts in general is a really collaborative process. It's usually not just one person. <laughs> so hey. Yep. It, yeah. Yep. So like hey, nice job, legends, for you know trying you know give a tribute piece to this one person. But you know maybe maybe next time understand that it's more than one person. Because <laughs> here's the thing: go go watch what Star Wars would have been if just George Lucas got his way. Yeah, it's called Episode One. <laughs> yeah, it's called Episode One. Yeah, it's just, I I think you overestimated old old Georgie on this one. But uh, yeah, so that was. <laughs> That was Raiders of the Lost Ark. It was fine by legend standards, even if there's a lot of really dumb stuff in it, but dumb stuff is par for the course. Yep. In this show, I I always kind of say, watching a new Legends of Tomorrow is kind of like watching The Room, where it's like, oh, wow, how are they going (laughs) to mess up this time, and how hilarious will it be when they do? (laughs) It's it's one of my favorite bad shows that I will keep up with, because, again, every so often they'll do something amazing. Yeah. An, an, another bit b- b- before we end this conversation, the show, because I just thought of another really thing that made me laugh and have a great time. So, so Rip is taken hostage at the end of the episode by Reverse Flash, and he's got all these torture tools. He's like, "Oh, I'm not going to torture you. They are." And then they turn over to the darkness, and I'm like, "Ooh, are there gonna be some new characters here we haven't seen before?" No, it's just Damien and Merlin again. I'm like, "Yeah, we know who they are. They've been here all episode." <laughs> yeah, it, it felt like that was. Like, they weren't meant to be in the episode, and that that was their reveal. (laughs) Yeah, why did they get such a cool reveal moment when we've literally spent the entire episode with them? Yeah, they should have had, like... Like, wouldn't it have been interesting if it was, like, like Captain Cold and... I I assume that's what it was going to be. And someone else. Like, that would have been a good way to bring him back. (laughs) Because they keep foreshadowing Captain Cold's return, and it's only a matter of time until he comes back. Oh, yeah, until he finishes making Prison Break or whatnot. Or whatever it is that got him away. It's it's only a matter of time until he comes back again, which, shit, you know, wouldn't it be fun if they had a Heat Wave and Captain Cold spinoff show? That'd be pretty cool. I'd watch the hell out of that. Actually, it's funny when, uh, when what is it, when Damien Dark and Merlin were walking around L.A., it almost seemed like they were trying out for their own spinoff series where they're like, ah, look how funny and interesting we can be, huh? Ain't, ain't we cool? <laughs> we could be like a buddy cop show, couldn't we? Just walking around, getting into adventures. Wouldn't that be great? And I'm kind of like, yeah, kind of. 
Yeah, yeah, it kind of would be cool, but then it gets stale really bad, uh, really quickly, because then you realize it's like, oh, well, they can solve all their problems just by killing each other. <laughs> it's true. It's true. That That's the problem with doing any series based solely on villains, isn't it? But yeah, yeah so, so that just about does it for Cape TV this week. We hope you all enjoyed it. As always, down in the comment section below, tell us what was your favorite moment from Geek TV this week, and what are you looking forward to in the weeks that come? And, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that'll just about end it for us. Matt and I <laughs> Matt and I have got a major, major uh, podcast marathon we got to do. But before we go, because, again, we understand a lot of people are listening to us for the first time, if you want to see more podcasts from me and Matt, you can listen to The Comic Multiverse over on the Cape Joel channel. And for Matt's work, you can find that... On Fortress of Solitude. You'll find it in a link or description on Twitter or a uh, Facebook or where, wherever I am. I'm, I'm everywhere. <laughs> He's everywhere, man, and no. Uh, I'm always around. <laughs> I'll also try and put some of our own information down below along with timestamps and everything. So if people want to check us out, I know Matt and I both have links to our Facebook pages for stuff. We both have Twitters and Instagrams and everything else and Patreons and all that other good stuff. You know this stuff by now. You're smart people. You know what the deal is. So we won't bother any more of your time. We're, we're at usually the time for this show. So we'll, we'll call this one a day. Thanks again for listening, everyone, to Cape TV. We don't have a sign-off yet for this show. I, I, I guess if I had to work on one, I'd say join us next time. Same Cape Time Play, same Cape Joel TV channel. <laughs> yeah, that needs work. I'll go work on that later. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>